Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing game lore, particularly in-depth monster ecologies. You can find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, you can join the channel as a member, any of which gets you access to exclusive Gluminati content on the Discord server. I welcome any questions you have, as always, any requests for video topics, uh, just put them in the comment section down below. If you enjoy the video, hit that subscribe button, I'd really appreciate it. I've often talked about the way demons dissolve away to nothing when killed outside the abyss. The essence of them travels back to the outer planes, remerges back with the abyss, and hopefully somehow spawns again within one of the abyssal spawning pits, or when pulled forth by a demon lord summoning a mass of demons around itself. Demons seem to emerge from the seething and corrupted matter. Inorganic materials such as walls and floors may warp and start to become more and more organic, to the point where demons are crawling out of this noxious and rapidly mutating mass. To the point where violently butating towers of heaving flesh explode outward like a flesh fang and eyeball geyser, tearing apart within moments as all the fresh demon spawn break free from it. When emerged they seem to obey some biological laws, but they, they share a lot of properties with fused elemental creatures such as Janazi and genies. Demonic energy though is inherently destructive, it warps and subverts matter, but it's not limitless, and sometimes a demonic entity may run short of this energy. It's not a huge shock that creatures of chaos may not have a foolproof way of respawning on their own home plane, so what happens to them? The demonic entities that don't manage to manifest a physical body in the roiling chaos and mayhem? Well normally they get pulled back into the nightmare chaos where mind and essence gets torn into by other minds and essences, each desperately trying to reform, which tends to break down into the lesser demons, with all but blank minds filled with nothing but the need to consume more energy and destroy as much as they can. The other result is the creation of a shadow demon, which are normally the result of some sort of magical disruption to the roof, reforming or summoning process. This is more likely to happen in the massive sprawling battles of the Blood War, where high-powered devils are forcing demon lords to expend huge bolts and blasts of primal power to ward off spells and masses of disciplined fiendish armies. The demon lords will wantonly release massive surges of chaotic power to disrupt reality and summon enormous mobs of demons most of which will be of the mindless destructive engine variety, but this process also spawns a lot of shadow demons. Fiendish armies have figured out over the eons that forcing powerful demons to summon in other demons or create new demons is actually easier to safely contain and wears down the more powerful demons fairly quickly. Chaotic energy disrupting reality is way, way more difficult to deal with than mindless snarling demon scum. Well, mostly. Anyway, the point is, magical disruption will result in partially reformed demons called shadow demons. They usually appear as wraith-like beings of darkness, a floating torso with strong arms and sweeping wings, the menacing shape of a head and the cloak of pitch black supernatural shadow. Shadow demons exist outside of the chaotic hierarchy of the abyss, such as there is, less subject to the overriding command of a demon lord whose chaotic energy actually spawned them. In some ways, it seems like they feel more of a kinship to the undead, but more than that later in the video. Shadow demons are a fascinating foe, falling between the cracks of cosmic definitions. They are fairly simple as this block of stats and as a monster in a fight, but their activities in the multiverse are far, far more interesting thanks to how weird and anomalous they really are. While the blood war rages between the demons and the devils and the Yugloths act as free agents, making huge profits working both sides, the demons have their own internal conflicts that are even more vicious and have been going on for even longer than the Blood War. Demogorgon, Orcus and Grast have been locked in an internal war with each other and the Shadow Demons have more of a sort of a Yugoloth role in this ever-shifting and always ready to escalate conflict. Demogorgon doesn't really rely much on Shadow Demons of course. Orcus has countless numbers of them in his service but is much more likely to trust the truly undead spirits under his utter command. No, it's Grast who makes the most use of Shadow Demons, particularly his mysterious super intelligent major domo and ambassador to the other demon lords named Verin, or Verin's alter ego named Stefano, who always seems to be sending secret notes or receiving secret reports from Shadow Demons, if you pay close attention. Then you have Grast's siblings, all rumoured to be born of the super powerful demon lord Pale Knight. They are Lupercio, Rizali, Vusaric, and Zavorgian all of which are quite weird. Well, aside from his sister Rizali, who actually looks so much like Grast, it's obvious that they're related. 
but his other sister, Zavorgian, is a bloated three-headed angel vulture demon lord that rules some undiscovered layer of the abyss. She's known as the Lady of Ripe Carrion, so I imagine that's not going to be a nice layer to visit. I'd love to go into more details about his siblings, but it's Lupercio, the demon lord of Sloth, who is of most interest since he manifests as an amorphous mass of darkness surrounded by 10 miles of magical darkness which is absolutely teeming with shadow demons feeding on his limitless shadow. As a demon lord of sloth he's not interested in basically anything beyond his own pleasures but it seems that shadow and darkness are something of a shared trait and bond between Lupercio and his brother and I can't help but think that Lupercio basically ignores Grast using all his shadow demons, much like an infested dog is not going to worry about a few missing fleas. However, it is one of Grast's children, known as Rule of Three, that really draws my attention. Appearing much like his father, Rule of Three is a half-demon Cambion working with Grast in a plan to unite the Batuzi Devils, the Tanari Demons and the Ugloths in a combined force that will unite to take over the Upper Plains. Rule of Three can be found in Grass Domain in the incredible city of Azagrat in the back room of the Golden Opportunity Inn, or in his lodgings in the city of Sigil. He's probably the most well-informed source of information on the Abyss in the multiverse at this point, constantly fed information via shadow demons working with his father and other beings involved in this grand plan, which is also known as the Rule of Three. True to his name, Rule of Three will only divulge information if seekers pay his price, which is always three versions of a very rare thing, such as three different Holy Avenger swords or three of the gems which lock away Thara's doom. So you best have a very important question for him considering those prices. Anyway, back to the Shadow Demons. When concealed from bright light, a Shadow Demon is all but invisible in the darkness and hovers around without making a sound. They're sensitive to light, with bright light inflicting disadvantage on attack rolls as well as on wisdom perception checks that rely on sight. Since they are insubstantial, they can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain, but a shadow demon will take 1d10 force damage if it ends its turn inside an object. It's a strange thing to look at a truly inky blackness. Even though the demon's wings and lower half must be three-dimensional, they always look like flat shadows on a surface somehow. They will avoid direct sunlight and intense radiant light damage causes them considerable pain, inflicting double normal damage. However, they have a number of damage resistances including all non-magical physical attacks, acid, fire, thunder, necrotic energy. They're also totally immune to cold, lightning and poisons of any kind, so they can be very difficult to kill without radiant damage to whittle them down quickly. Although insubstantial, they do have an armor class of 13 and from 24 to 108 with an average of 66 hit points. Most attacks will pass right through them and the Shadow Demons make perfect use of their damage resistances and immunities to pass through walls of fire, sink down into pools of acid or escape into zones of frigid cold. In the first appearance of them in the Fiend Folio, I actually have it right here, uh, Shadow Demons also have a bite attack and they use their wings not for true flight but to make bursts of speed that they can do every other round. So uh, if you want to include that in your game, feel free. That's legit lore from the old days. The Book of Vile Darkness also tells us that shadow demons skitter and flit about with great speed and supernatural nimbleness, often being mistaken for the form of undead known as shadows. They're known to trade in souls when they have the opportunity, bargaining with hags in the dismal markets of Hades, or using their own magical abilities to trap souls themselves selling them for information and influence which gains them more status and more interesting access to any of the countless plots and schemes going on between the major powers of infernal politics. This is not exactly the same as serving these demon lords and such, they tend to avoid their company and they very rarely hang out with lesser demons unless they really really have to. The book goes on to say that on the material plane, shadow demons sometimes work as advisors or assistants to evil creatures of great power, a dragon, an evil king, a powerful demonologist, a demon lord, or a similar villain. Shadow demons generally serve their chosen master well, especially if they are able to gain a great many souls while doing so. If the souls are evil, all the better. Shadow demons are also interested in tempting and corrupting mortals, and if, when its master finally dies, the shadow demon is able to snatch that soul too, all the better. 4th edition D&D went into some more detail about their soul trading, which is unusual activity for a demon. It says that the key difference between devils and shadow demons is their end goal. 
Shadow demons are more like the undead in that their aim is the complete obliteration of all mortal life, and unlike the devils, they don't acquire souls in a bid for power and status. Well, they certainly do get some of that, and they do trade it for magical power, as I'm going to mention later, but really they're just, they will just want to take those souls and trade them off knowing that they will most likely be the end of that soul's existence. That's satisfying enough for them. In combat, Shadow Demons tend to use magical darkness to their best advantage. They certainly have through all the earlier editions of the games. Since 5th edition has not got any shadow creation powers attributed to them, but the powers of Shadow Demons should be supplemented with additional evil magic that is not shown in the basic stat block, because Shadow Demons trade souls for those magical powers, keep your players on their toes. They don't know that the Shadow Demon is merely casting a limited stock of a few spells, they may just assume the Shadow Demons can do that as a normal spell-like ability. And you're under no obligation to make the Shadow Demons uniform and predictable. Their very creation is a result of disruption and chaos, often heavily influenced by a particular power or demon lord. So, by all means, give them aspects of the abilities and features of those demon lords and powers. They may even have the abilities of devils, like Dukes of Hell, who knows. One massive change to the monster listing is the removal of the spell Magic Jar, which has always been their method uh, that the Shadow Demons use to capture souls in special gemstone receptacles. When assassinating a target, they wait until it's most vulnerable and get the job done quickly and violently as possible, tearing their victim to pieces with their shadowy claws. 5th edition says that they're plus 5 to hit a creature within 5 feet, inflicting 2d6 plus 3 psychic damage, or if the demon had advantage on the attack roll, 46 plus 3 psychic damage. I'd advise giving them the ability to stun a creature if they get a natural 20 on their hit roll. The creature will be incapacitated, won't be able to make any movements, and only speaks falteringly. Plus, they will be unable to make any strength or dexterity saving throws, and all attacks against them will have advantage, allowing the Shadow Demon to tear them apart even faster. Let the creature with a DC 14 wisdom saving throw at the start of each turn to shake off the stunned condition. Pay close attention to that plus 7 on all stealth checks for the Shadow Demon. You will no, no doubt be rolling plenty of stealth checks. Also, keep in mind that these things have an intelligence of 14, so they're pretty smart and very cunning. A version of the 4th edition Shadow Demon can be converted to 5th edition with their ability to void rake a victim with their claws, and also release a necrotic burst of shadow from the negative energy plane. The void rake is a melee attack exactly the same as I just listed. However, the victim's remaining hit point total becomes their maximum hit points until the end of the Shadow Demon's next turn, which can be much more dangerous than it sounds. The release of necrotic energy simply creates a 15 foot radius of a zone of darkness that will cause like 1d4 necrotic damage to any living being not immune to necrotic energy that starts its turn in the area, give them a DC 14 constitution save for half damage with a minimum damage of one point. It's just some fun options, you can take them or leave them. Some interesting notes. Ancient black dragons in particular are sought out by shadow demons due to some mysterious link between the two, whether social or in some way biological, nobody knows for sure. Also, while a great many that are involved with the scheme of Orcus, the drow goddess Kirin Sali is also known to keep many shadow demons in her entourage. Within the lower planes, away from the demon hordes, shadow demons tend to congregate in spooky locations that they roughly term villages, where they sculpt statues out of raw shadow stuff. They can only do this in the abyss, by the way. But always, they've got concealed portals to other planes, particularly the Shadowfell, Border Negative Energy, Demi Plains, Hades, and so on. Another interesting quirk is that they always tend to trap the soul of the loudest, most evil, obnoxious, and self-centered individuals they come across. Other than that, their next favorite target is the powerful minds and wills of wizards, whose souls always fetch a very high price. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Subscribestar or Patreon for links for all the full scripts for these videos. Don't forget that this video has subtitles, and buy some Teespring merchandise. Wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Thank you.